In case you missed it, Starship flew for a third time, and what a flight it was. There was so much stunning footage and amazing views, and so many things to look at that are new for us to analyze and talk about. So let's look at everything we've learned so far and what might be to come in the future. Howdy, Star fans. I'm Jack Byer for NSF, and this is your Starbase Update. All right, let's start by going over all of the action in the days leading up to launch. Of course, before we could see a launch, we needed a full stack. And exactly that came over the weekend. But before that even happened, we got some good news. The removal of work platforms and other things from the launch site. This kind of clearing of the launch site is usually the beginning of good news regarding launches. Remember, at this time, we didn't even have a launch license yet. We then saw work on Ship 28's pressure plate. This plate is usually removed before an imminent lift, so that was another sign that we needed. You probably know the drill at this point. The pad was cleared, the klaxon was sounded, the QD arm was retracted, the whole party as usual. Well, as usual as it can be to lift the world's largest rocket with a pair of chopsticks. Once the stabilizers were attached, we then got a lift of Ship 28 for the final time on top of Booster 10. SpaceX then removed Ship 28's transport stand and also conducted a test of the water deluge system before launch. At this point, the ship for Starship's fourth flight, Ship 29, was still present at the launch site. Ship 29 used the time there to perform a quick spin prime test of what looked like all six of its engines, before being removed from Stand B and getting rolled back to the production site to not be too close to the full stack once launch approaches. And then, roughly 24 hours before launch on Wednesday, we got some welcome news from the FAA. It began with the publication of the environmental assessment into the impacts of splashdowns into the Indian Ocean. Starship's new splashdown zone. This assessment explained the operations that SpaceX wanted to conduct and that the study would be looking at. In particular, it looked into performing 10 operations, aka launches, a year, with five of those launches being dedicated to a flight profile that was the same as we saw on Starship Flight 3. That is, those five would plan for the ship to launch into a nearly orbital trajectory and enter over the Indian Ocean and hit the water at terminal velocity. The remaining five allowed launches would then be a mix of similar near-orbital missions where the ship is expended on purpose and burns up on re-entry. Basically, it doesn't carry any tiles or flaps like Ship 26, for example, or where the ship is planned to re-enter over the Indian Ocean, but instead of hitting the water hard, it performs a soft landing in the water. And about those soft landings, the document mentions that, quote, SpaceX has a near-term goal of soft water landings by the end of 2024, and the ultimate goal of landing the Starship vehicle on land slash barges to ensure reliability of the vehicle. However, a high degree of uncertainty remains for the timing of successful missions to accomplish that goal, close quote. The takeaway from this is that, as expected, SpaceX eventually plans to bring Starships back to land, but before that, they need to test re-entry through the atmosphere and get a soft landing of the ship on the water. And yes, we sort of already knew all of this, but now at least we have a timeline of when SpaceX expects to move on to these objectives. Based on this study and documentation, the FAA issued a Finding of No Significant Impact, or FONSI, if you don't remember that acronym from before. This means that SpaceX can conduct the operations as we just described. But just because it's allowed and there was a finding of no significant impact, SpaceX still needed a launch license. And exactly that is what happened a little bit later in the day. Right on cue, just a bit later in the day on March 13th, the license modification came in for Starship's third flight. This modification changed the destination for the ship from the Pacific Ocean to the Indian Ocean. But it also said, once again, that this was only valid for this flight in particular, Flight 3, unless a new modification is made to the license. With the launch license in hand, the stage was set and SpaceX began to once again prepare for the launch of the world's largest and most powerful rocket of all time. All right, let's jump into the night of the flight and recap all of the things that we saw in the lead up to launch. First off, the tank farm, which saw several upgrades in between flights, showed great performance, as it seemed SpaceX was working with no major issues during pre-tanking operations. Roadblocks, of course, were already up, and Boca Chica Village was evacuated in preparation for flight. After what appears to be a flawless countdown, SpaceX then entered a pattern of multiple delays right before propellant load. It seems that weather, and also a boat in the range, pushed SpaceX 
85 minutes into the 110 minute available window. But then they finally got into fueling. They cleared the T minus 40 second operational hold point and we saw the perfect ignition of all 33 Raptor engines. The vehicle cleared the tower and we could see that SpaceX was once again able to repeat what they did on flight two. The ascent phase of the super heavy booster looked flawless with all engines running just fine. They reached hot staging and we saw stage separation. It's crazy that for something that was untried and seemed honestly risky a few months ago, it was just like another launch for SpaceX. And so here we entered uncharted territory. The booster successfully completed its boost back burn and headed towards the nominal splashdown point in the Gulf of Mexico. And remember, after this boost back burn, unlike Falcon 9, there is no entry burn. SpaceX wants to optimize the super heavy landing profile compared to Falcon 9 and not perform a re-entry burn. This booster is just built to withstand the forces without slowing down. Booster 10 then even reached the upper part of its landing burn. However, obviously, something went wrong here. The booster started to roll back and forth at an altitude of about six kilometers. The booster was planned to start up all inner 13 engines and then go down to just three, but the engine diagram did not show 13 engines igniting. In fact, it didn't seem like more than three engines showed up on that graphic. Also, if we look really closely at the footage, it seems like there was some green exhaust from Raptors eating themselves, which is not good. According to SpaceX, the booster was lost at approximately 462 meters above the surface. So they got pretty close, but alas, no cigar. So that's what happened to the booster, but what about Ship 28? Well, after stage separation, Ship 28 successfully ignited all six of its Raptor engines and conducted a nominal full duration burn. Remember, this was not achieved on the last flight due to a leak and subsequent fire during the planned liquid oxygen dump. So at this point in the test, SpaceX has already achieved significant progress. With the successful ascent portion of the flight complete, the ship went into a coast phase, bringing us amazing shots from its onboard flap camera brought down to the ground via Starlink. But Ship 28 didn't just get launched into space for fun and the beautiful views. SpaceX had some actual work to do. They wanted to test a cryogenic propellant transfer for NASA. They wanted to conduct a test of the Pez dispenser payload bay door. And they wanted to test relighting one of the Raptor engines while in space. We saw the opening and sort of closing of the Pez dispenser door. We'll get to that in a second. And we did hear over the nets that the cryogenic propellant transfer was accomplished, although we don't yet know how successful it was. Unfortunately, the Raptor Relight demo was aborted by the onboard computers, but at least we got a view of the Raptor engine chill process while the vehicle was in space. SpaceX later reported that this abort was due to the high roll rate of the ship during the coast phase, an issue that would plague them for the rest of the flight. Now we get to my and probably your favorite part, Thanks to those Starlink dishes on Ship 28, we got treated to what might be described as one of the greatest views in all of spaceflight history. And that, of course, was the re-entry plasma from Starship. Still going at a high roll rate, the ship managed to stabilize itself for a bit, and we saw plasma around the flaps. Just absolutely stunning views. The conclusion of the flight came shortly after. 49 minutes into it, SpaceX lost contact with Starship and did not reach the later phase of re-entry but getting there was not only visually stunning, but also mind-blowing progress for this program. Now let's try and wrap our heads around exactly what it was we saw, where things went wrong, exactly what happened, and what new things we've learned, both from launch and statements by SpaceX afterwards. Of course, all of this is still very early, but thanks to a statement SpaceX released shortly after launch, we have a somewhat decent understanding of the event. Let's start with Booster first. SpaceX indeed confirmed that all 33 Raptor engines on the Super Heavy booster started up and completed a full duration burn. It might be a little bit too early to say this, but it certainly seems like at this point SpaceX has its hands on a fully operational, full flow, staged combustion cycle engine, which just by itself is absolutely mind blowing. Separation, hot staging and ignition of Starship all also went well. And SpaceX confirmed that the booster conducted a nominal boost back burn. Do you hear that? It's the rampant speculation siren, because now we're going to get into a little bit of the uncertain area of things. SpaceX only says that Booster 10 ignited engines for the landing burn and then experienced a rud 462 meters above the surface. But why? Well, we saw the booster fighting to maintain control during descent and before landing burn ignition. Could this be another case of sloshing propellants? 
That could starve the engines of propellant and explain the green bits of exhaust we saw coming out of them. Not to mention the failure of several other engines to start, which could point in that direction. It's also interesting to see that SpaceX mentioned a rapid unscheduled disassembly rather than an impact with the ocean as the cause for the loss of the booster especially given that the onboard footage kind of implied it did hit the ocean. We know the FTS was already saved, as during entry we could hear that call out, although it was very faint and in the middle of lots of well-earned cheering from the SpaceX employees. We certainly don't know what sort of data SpaceX has or what they saw, but it'll be interesting to see what they say once the FAA investigation is complete. That's another important thing to mention here. After launch, the FAA announced that it had opened a mishap investigation led by SpaceX as a result of the loss of both vehicles. We often get some interesting results out of these investigations in terms of what went wrong, so we'll definitely wait for what the FAA and SpaceX have to say once they finish it. Another interesting tidbit that we didn't necessarily know before is that the landing burn of the Super Heavy booster utilizes all 13 center engines. That is a lot of thrust to slow down the booster. Of course, that's only for the beginning of the landing burn, and eventually it'll cut down to three engines, but either way, wow. Once they start landing these things soft in the water and then attempting catches, it is going to be quite a sight to see, and hopefully here with an insane sonic boom. Okay, now it's time to talk about Ship 28's epic journey. It seems that the roll control was an overall problem during the mission. We saw Starship having essentially no attitude control during the coast stage. It almost looked like the ship was performing the old Apollo era barbecue rolls, if you remember those. The SpaceX update indicates that this roll was not nominal, and as mentioned earlier, caused the abort of the Raptor engine relight test. Such a roll could of course lead to a suboptimal angle during re-entry, which doesn't exactly help your chances of surviving it. The re-entry being this suboptimal might also not have properly tested whether or not the heat shield worked. It's kinda hard to test your heat shield when the engine section is what's pointing into the plasma flow rather than, you know, the, the heat shield. And this is a pity, because Ship 28's tiles seem to have fared a whole lot better than Ship 25's tiles. While maybe a couple of tiles were seen missing from Ship 28's flap cam, we don't really know if those could have affected entry. Again, because of the attitude control issues. At the very least, we got to see the interaction of the plasma against the body of the ship. And I'm positive that the team at SpaceX that modeled that interaction is now heads down, looking at all the footage and comparing it to their simulations. Now, let's get back to the payload bay door because what happened here is a little bit tricky. When we saw it open, at first it looked to be going quite well, but it never seemed to open all the way. Then it was time to close it, and at first it seemed to go well too. But then, around T plus 30 minutes into the flight, the door seemed to snap and appeared to be jammed. We're not sure what else might have happened with it in the minutes after because SpaceX never showed us any more footage of that. However, on the SpaceX update after the flight, the company said, quote, Starship accomplished several of the flight test's additional objectives, including opening and closing of its payload door. End quote. So I guess from that we can say it did work in the end? Or perhaps this wording is just meant to imply that the mechanism was successfully tested opening and closing without necessarily confirming that it was a successful full closure of the door. You decide. But despite the things that went wrong, so much was accomplished here. This vehicle went further and faster and demonstrated a significant improvement relative to Flight 2, in the same way that Flight 2 demonstrated a significant improvement relative to Flight 1. While recovery will seemingly take a few more flights to nail down, the ascent portion went really well for both stages. SpaceX is essentially just a couple of seconds of burn time of the ship away from having a expendable launch vehicle that can loft a hundred tons into low Earth orbit, which feels just insane to say out loud. But of course, the Starship program isn't stopping here, and the future is about reusability. That future needs more flights, and well, we already had a spin prime of Ship 29 early this week. The ship will be paired with Booster 11 for the fourth flight of Starship. Booster 11 has already completed cryotesting, it has received engines, and at this point may just be a very few short weeks away from going to the orbital launch mount for engine testing. Of course, that will have to happen after some refurbishment work is done at the pad. Once again, the orbital launch mount got cooked by the Raptor engines, so it'll have to be inspected and repaired before Booster 11 can even be installed on it. 
We did see workers quickly coming back to the launch site right after flight to install scaffolding, and the dance floor was also brought to the launch site to start the process of repairing the OLM. I guess we can say that work has resumed on the orbital launch mount. Uh, Alex. Alex made me say that. Or maybe it was Adrian. Either way, it was one of the two of them. You can blame them in the comments. The new protections to the base of the launch tower, the two reinforced tanks, and the blast wall near the LOX subcoolers seem to do their job well, and no major damage seems to have occurred. The chopsticks had a few wires hanging from their side, but they look to be in even better shape than after Flight 2. In the lead up to Flight 4, we'll obviously have to see not just vehicle testing, but also the completion of the mishap investigation and whatever fixes it deems necessary implemented on both vehicles to correct any issues. We'll probably see more full stack testing and then hopefully a license and a launch. So now the question becomes, when Flight 4? And thankfully, we have at least an estimate for the earliest possible date that it could happen. That's because earlier this week, well before Flight 3, SpaceX filed a communications permit to request permission to communicate with Starship during Flight 4. This permit, if approved, would be valid from April 15th and would last for a standard six month period. Now, this doesn't mean that SpaceX is actually targeting April 15th, just that this permit won't allow these operations any day before that. So it seems like we have a solid month of time for SpaceX to get ready for Flight 4, at the very least. With how well everything seems to have gone, if you told me that Flight 4 ends up happening mid to end of April, I'd believe you. But I think a more realistic date is sometime in May. And honestly, even that would be an absolutely insanely rapid turnaround for what is, I cannot stress enough, the world's most powerful and largest rocket ever built. So what do you think? When will Flight 4 happen? April? May? Later than that? Let us know in the comments. You know how this works. All right, that's it for this week. Thanks for watching. And as always, don't forget, be excellent to each other.